Hello everyone. Thanks for coming here today. Um, so we will start the third day of Satya. Uh, Satya is the annual fest of our society, Gandhi Amitka Study Center. Um, when we see in all these uh, educational institutions, we see that the caste scores have always been limited. We see that initially it was the class discourse that used to take over the caste. Uh, then we see now that the winds coming from the right, it is usually you know reducing space for caste discourse. Uh, and then people ask, what can we as students do? Because in such times, people do want big changes. People want, you know, some, some radical thing, changing everything. And then they, and some people, they would prefer small changes. And then the question arises, what do we prefer? And people can prefer different things. Uh, some would say that small, some say, or some can say big. But uh, our decision to start this lecture uh, was one of the things in this election. Um, this would, this would uh, usually be called our keynote lecture, uh, but we renamed it, and we renamed it as Annual Savitri Bai Phule Lecture. And I believe that in a institute, in, in institutes across Delhi University, which are dominated by uh, lectures on the name of Bose and Banerjee's, I think one lecture by the name of Phule would do a lot of good to this. <laughs> So, like this is our small step towards a positive end, a positive end towards justice and more equality in this country. And uh, I believe that as long as, you know, no matter what intensity or what speed we go ahead with, as long as our destination is the same, that is our aim is the same of a caste-free country, uh, I think it matters, no matter what intensity we go ahead with. And, uh, you know, such lectures, even if there is just one lecture, this was our attempt to make sure that, you know, no matter what happens to this institute in the coming time, if we name it as the annual Savitri Bhai Phule lecture, at least every year they will have to call someone to speak on anti-caste movement and do something about it. So, it tells that, it tells that at least there is someone in there who is thinking and as long as there is someone who is thinking you know there is no complete loss and I think Rohit was also uh, similar in many ways uh, and Rohit wanted to know more about stars, galaxies and universe maybe he wanted to reach a place where caste would no longer affect his life and uh, I think today's lecture is also about that how caste in many ways has no boundaries, wherever you must go, there will be cast. Uh, but somehow we continue. Somehow we continue because, you know, no matter how much sorrow or sadness there is in the world, uh, we also have this thing called hope, which keeps coming and coming again. So with this, uh, I would like to call Ishan to introduce today's speaker, and then we'll start the lecture. Well, thank you, Sanaj, for introducing the event and the keynote lecture. Thanks a lot. And now the responsibility of introducing the speaker lies on my shoulder. So I will not take much time to introduce Professor Elaya, as introducing him is like engaging with the depths of the ocean. And Ambedkar at orientation, he is an anti-caste political activist, a theorist, a writer, and the man who carved out an intellectual space where the common, or rather the real people of India, which are called Dalit or Bahujan, can speak. He has been awarded the Mahatma Jyoti Rao Phule Award and the Nehru Fellowship between 1994 and 1997. He was a recipient of the Visa Award for his magnum opus, Why I Am Not a Hindu. He currently serves as the Director of the Center of Social Exclusion and Inclusive Policy at Maulana Azad National Urdu University in Hyderabad. Also, the pre uh, premier universities of the world have introduced his extensively researched works in their curriculum. And I remember when I was a school student, you had a very complex relationship with Kancha Ilaya. And when some of his writings were excluded from the curriculum, crowds of students gathered 
in support of Ilaya and said, We love Kancha and we love his books. This itself speaks for the love you have for Kancha. And if I am right, Ilaya has also said, India's real engineers are Kumars, Lohars, Karigars and Durlings. And they created modern India even before the institutional training by the institutions like the IIDs. Elia needs no more introduction as his writings speak for him. His notable works include God as a Political Philosopher, Buddha's Challenge to Brahmanism, The Weapon of the Other, Dalit Bahujan Writings and the Remaking of Indian Nationalist Thought, Turning the Pot, Tilling the Land, Dignity of Labour in Our Times, Buffalo Nationalism, A Critique of Spiritual Fascism among numerous others. So deducting from them, the literal shepherd has a characteristic to travel anywhere in all the seasons. But when we engage with the writings of Professor Shepherd, we see the settled realities of India, be they modern or having roots in antiquity. And so we welcome Professor Elia to speak on the topic caste beyond borders, anti-caste laws in the West. And the caste itself has become popular nowadays and many Western institutions have included it in the discriminatory discourse and many intellectuals crave to understand the phenomenon of caste. So let us have the loudest round of applause for the speaker speaking on the same. So, I invite Avishi, Kushi and Saranj to give momentum to Professor Shepard. outset, uh, let me thank Gandhi Ambedkar Study Circle of St. Stephen's uh, College of Delhi for inviting me to give as uh, the first speakers were saying the first Savitri Bhai Pule lecture in this college it is a great honor. And she was our first woman teacher in the entire living history of India. So the honor to give her lecture in St. Stephen's is given to me. Students, I really thank you for this great opportunity that you give me. Students, faculty members including the Dean and my friends, uh, one who really propagates Savitri Bhai Pule and Mahatma Pule philosophy uh, with a, an organization called Truth Seekers International, Sakya Shodha Worldwide. My friend Sunil Sardar is also here. So, today we are living in a world which is in many respects beyond borders. I was not in a position to imagine around 1990 when the whole idea of globalization was being debated and one of the key central points as a danger to the world that was going to come because of the globalization at that time from mostly my left friends, intellectuals, was that the world will be like a village. Now at that time, when everybody was 
saying that the world will be like a village once it gets globalized. I was in a in a kind of myopic thinking, a negative utopia that would the world will have caste too everywhere as it exists in the village today. So today when uh, the student friends ask, you know, what do we have as a, as a topic of today's discussion, uh, in back and forth uh, discussion with them, I said perhaps this could be asked beyond borders and the anti-caste laws in the West could be one of the most relevant issues as the California state has already introduced a caste bill. Seattle, which is the center of the universal connecting modern invisible technology called internet and Google, Amazon has already passed an anti-caste law ordinance and many American universities including one of the Canadian school districts have brought about anti-caste rules on their rule book for the students, faculty and civil society to not to practice caste. <coughs> now I know in a, in a this college historically is known as very elite center of this country and uh, it produced many rulers of this country of course including Pakistan's Yahya Khan uh, from this college. Now, when we talk about caste today, what, what do we think about it? What are we talking about caste? Are we talking about that the Varna order that was institutionalized in the Rigvedic text for centuries in an oral transmission form. And ever since Kautilya's Arthashastra was written, into a written mode, not in a universally writable form of a stable structure of writing on leather scrolls, but the Indian writers from the beginning wrote on a very ancient unscientific system called Talapatras. Leather scroll was a better paper at that time. But the Indian Brahmin writers did not accept to write on leather scroll because leather was untouched. And that is where human untouchability got deepened with the first industrial revolution of India at that time. And Kautilya wrote on Kalapatra. And then all Granthas from Rig Veda to all Vedas including Ramayana Mahabharata were written on Kalapatras. So much of it did not survive. But from that to now, while speaking in one of the globally known Christian uh, 
higher educational institution in Delhi University. Now, because the earliest global paper in China, all pre Confucian writing was on leather scrolls. In Israel, starting from Genesis, writing was on leather scrolls. Now, they are all preserved from ancient times in the museum. And in Greek, writing was on leather scrolls. Only in India, because of untouchability of science, not human being. Please remember, science was untouchable at that time. Therefore, leather became untouchable and writing did not take place on leather scroll which resembles the people. From that day to today, uh, we have traveled a lot, no doubt, but we are equally backward in innovating science and catching up with the world and producing not only goods and commodities that were required for the masses, because we were the one, quite sadly, did not understand that this country's earliest human being alone could domesticate buffalo and cow was domesticated all over the world. Buffalo does not exist to give milk in America, Europe. And cow exists everywhere to give milk. But buffalo is the largest milk producing animal. And that became also ideologically untouchable because it's a black animal. So such contradictory life that we instituted into our knowledge system through the means of technology untouchability, animal untouchability led to the practical idea of the earliest industry establishing human beings untouchability that were the damage. And look at the contradiction. The hair on the edge should be black. If that gets white, you paint black. But the color of the buffalo is bad because it is black. And you drink its milk because it gives a white milk. You know, one day in uh, Telangana, we decided that uh, we should uh, worship buffalo now to give black milk so that they don't drink. <laughs> we drink, we drink black, we respect black. A buffalo is in every house uh, economic animal. And sadly in my lifetime, very sadly in my lifetime, I faced a situation from the biggest universities of University of this country. I would have understood if my book were to be proposed to be banned because it was why I am not a Hindu or because it was post Hindu India, but even buffalo nationalism was proposed to be banned. So, this is the problem of caste. Caste is not just what you are eating at home, what you are treating with somebody in the slum or what you are living in the urban domain or rural domain, where are the spatial structures? Caste is not that. Caste is fundamentally an anti-tool discovery instrument. Production anti-production central structure. You know, right now I am working on a book. In future people may 
may not even like to read it. And one of the chapters is whether spade is the symbol of civilization or book is the symbol of civilization. Spade, which was the source of agrarian production, whether that becomes the civilization symbol or the book. Regimes are saying civilization lies in books. And saying no, book can never represent civilization. It is the production tools that represent civilization. It is the production technology that represents the civilization. And the earliest tool that even before the Israelites could really handle it, even the Egyptian could handle it, even the Greeks could handle it, as a Plato, before Plato wrote his Republic or Aristotle wrote his politics, much before that, whether they had Olympics games, but there was no Spain and there was no comparable civilization to that of Arabian city where Spain was central and brick-making, wood-crafting, leather technology already arrived in, 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 by the time we built Arabian civilization. But that was made untouchable. Leather made untouchable to writing, leather made untouchable to God. Now, the result is the present education system. In spite of our freedom in 1947, we still look for foreign books. We still look for foreign universities. You know, the boy who brought me from airport to here said, Sir, I got my seat in Cambridge. But unfortunately, I couldn't go there because I had no enough money to go there and I had to join St. Stephen. I told him, could you join here? Uh, let, us, let us, over a period of time, convert Indian schools and colleges into a better schools and colleges than America and Europe. Let us be better nationalists. But how do you do it? You do it by going to the root of your Spain. By going to the root of your root, domesticated buffalo, which could not have been imagined to be domesticated by white American in America in 15th century. They killed all the buffaloes. But Indians domesticated. And I can probably say it was the shepherds who could domesticate animals. And I belong to that. Shepherd is shown as a fool. Oh, the sheep came to India. And in fact, when I became a lecturer, when I went to the university uh, administrative building for interview and coming back, came back to my college, was stepping up, one of the typical upper caste persons stood there and said, I believe you went to the interview. I said, yes. I believe you also got it. I said, is it? I didn't know, but you came to know. You come to know very early everything. You have connections very well. Then if I become lecturer, I am very glad I become. Then he said, what do you do? I will become lecturer. I said, what do you mean? I teach. You teach? You highlight? You are from village? So he asked me in which language you teach. That means, he thought that I don't know English because I never studied in any St. Stephen, St. Joseph, St. Mary or St. Xavier. I studied under the tree and I said, I will, when I could teach sheep in my village, it is not difficult to teach your children in the college. So, he was 
speak in conductor English. Ticket to continue going. I said, I, I spoke in British English. I learned it deliberately. I said, I'll speak to your children in Western English. And they will not be able to understand. And this is the arrogance. Shepherds cannot speak, teach. Dealers cannot teach. Shoemakers cannot teach. Jars who have land, who gave that land to the whole of Delhi cannot become professors. That's what they say. So this is a past. Past is not just, are you practicing here in this form? Are you practicing in that form? Then nationalism. I said, who else can be a nationalist better than those who domesticated buffalo? Did China domesticate buffalo? Did America domesticate buffalo? So, you think that leather technologies, pot makers, and you know, history students know, many of them told me that they are reviewing history as major. And including, you know, our own greatest historian like Romila Tapper. The other school does not accept his historian at all. That's a different question. Even though they wrote right, they say that she is not historian. I, I do not agree with her. But every one of them recognized what is one of the symbols of our civilization. But how did they make what? Who made what? I was investigating like a mad guy. I wanted to know whether one Benerjee, Chatterjee, Mukherjee, Shastri, Sharma made one pot. <laughs> I wanted to know. Pot is the symbol of civilization. You also accept whether you are Marxist school or you are liberal, you are nationals, you are accept. But you don't ask a question whether any, any generational time in my history, my family history, was there a pot maker? At any generation time, after all, you know, like a, like a mad shepherd, I one day said, Arappa could be my great, great, great grandfather who built Arappan city. He said, why are you comparing them? I said, look, in all south, Appa is a name. Ellappa, Mallappa, Allappa, Arappa. It doesn't exist in north. Ayya and Appa, South Indian names, and Arappa is the man who built Arappan city. So he could be, he could be my great great grandfather because he must have domesticated buffaloes, sheep, and goat like my grandfather. You know, caste cannot be understood through the books as they were written, either by Evan Srinivasan or Andhra Please leave them. They are from this university only, I know. And studied abroad. And strongly for studying in this country in order to abolish caste from tribal area to Delhi to Gali, but only in English media. When the present government said, one nation, one language, I said, yes, but that one language should be English. <laughs> Once tribals, Dalits, Adivasis, shepherds, killers know English, I will tell you, no European ever after European Britain, after uh, the present uh, Indian born Prime Minister, Sunar, no British fellow can become Prime Minister. All dealers, Dalits, Adivasis go there, become Prime Ministers. Yeah. And no Kamala Harris, but all our girls from villages will go and become Presidents of America. Hillary Clinton failed. <laughs> because Indian women and Indian producing children have world class brain, but because of caste, it was killed in the childhood. You understand the point?
because in the past it was killed in the childhood and therefore now today today when Aisha Wahab an Afghan woman could introduce a bill in California Senate our Indian friends are going and protesting in front of our house. And a Chama Swati or somebody in Seattle. She is from upper caste. She introduced the bill in Seattle. They were trying to protest. Now, whatever could be my religion, whatever could be my race, the single question all of us do young students should ask is, what is an anti-caste law? And not many years have studied the laws that American Seattle introduced and the California uh, Senate introduced goes beyond abolition of caste, beyond Indian constitutional proposition. You may ask how? Indian constitution only abolished untouchable. Now, what the American laws will do tomorrow is, if a Dalit boy or a girl abuses a Brahmin by name caste, that will become an offense in America. You cannot abuse or bully any person by caste as an idiom of expression. That is what their law is. Now, why you, you are opposed to that? Why are you protesting against it? That means the Vishwa Guru does not want Vishwa equality. <laughs> Vishwa Guru does not want Vishwa equality. Vishwa Guru wants Vishwa caste system. <laughs> now, this cannot happen now because I was a practical witness in 2001 when myself and Professor and his wife and you know team of us took the caste issue to Durban United Nations to put caste on par with race on the UN agenda and to my shock all progressive intellectuals of India including Ram Chandra Goha including the Gupta in Jain, they all said these people are taking unnecessarily taking our own national issue to international platform. You are wrong. Ramchandra Goa wrote two articles abusing me that Kancha Elaya is trying to internationalize caste, which is our own national issue. But these intellectuals never understood. Was, was, what was race, race issue? Was race issue there in India? Black and white? Was it there in China? What is there in Eastern world? Race issue basically came into UN agenda from America. The American blacks. And was America not in a position to abolish its own race question? Was it not democratic enough? He did not have the tradition of bringing, by then, the civil rights law has been already passed in America and the race was taken to UN after that. When race could be taken to UN by American blacks and American government accepts, the then Indian government, including at that time, Vajpayee was the Prime Minister, but Congress also did not agree with that. Left did not agree with us. We said, whatever is the source of inequality in any corner of the country, that will be the problem of the entire world. <laughs> UN is meant for abolition of all forms of inequalities if that inequality is destroying the life 
and labor and dignity of a small group of tribe in some corner. It should go to you. That's how the indigenous people's issue came. When Burakonini's issue from Japan would come to UN, why not caste? And I tell you, we were tortured in that one. We were not allowed to speak to international agencies. We were not allowed to meet countries. We were not allowed to speak to uh, other people. So what we did was, we started speaking to individuals who were sensible, coming from different parts of the country, on outside forums. In outside forums, we started educating them. That 10 days where we were there, we could not go to UN headquarter meetings at all, but we were educating outside. And the result is today's loss in America. Today's loss in Canada. And tomorrow, already, the British House of Lords introduced a bill that caste cannot be practiced in America. It should become a law. And already American Congress introduced a bill in 19, 2010. But it was not signed by required number of Congress members. And internet system, they thought would abolish caste. But it was a Dalit second generation girl Kenmozi Rajan, who started Equality Labs discovered internet is full of caste. They found out caste in editing of bio, biographic sketches in Wikipedia. And they started Dalitpedia. So whose biography should be there in that it were being edited by Indians. I tell you, wherever this word Indian is there, we know who they are. <laughs> and now they are using the word Hindu. I have no problem. Okay, if you are defining Hindu, is a major religion. When in 1992, I started writing why I am not a Hindu, 96 it was published. My simple thesis in that was, that as a shepherd, I could, I never played with a Brahmin child. I never played with a Banya child. A Dalit child never played with me. They were not allowed. And if I played with him, my mother would ask me to get, take bath and come inside. And if all this was happening, if all of us belong to one religion, what is God doing? If all of us belong to one religion of one, one God, that God first has to give right to equal approach to God, right? Therefore, I coined this term. Unfortunately, universities don't carry it. This is called spiritual democracy. Is there spiritual democracy in this religion? Is there spiritual democracy in Indian Islam? I raised this question at the time of the hijab issue. I told my Muslim friends, no, if you don't allow Muslim women to come to mass and dress as she likes, I don't support your issue. Because inequality I can't support and justify it outside. It's not possible, whatever you relate. So, I said that. But the point is, what is spirit, centrality of spiritual life? Indian religions, including Buddhism, Christianity, in fact, uh, Professor Daniel, your dean of it, I asked uh, all the bishops of Christian educational institutions in one of the seminars, when they were being persecuted, nuns were being at all, they called me for their support. Dalit intellectuals should support us. I went to the meeting, all the bishops were there, Saint Xavier, Saint Joseph, Saint Laiolas, everybody. And the saints have educated only non-saints of upper order. So I asked them, you have never taught me English, 
English, why should I support you? Then I quoted your college. You are saying Stephens has educate, educated Arun Shauri. Please go and ask. You are staying uh, just, uh, you know, one college in uh, Pakistan educated Abwani. Please go and ask. All of them studied in St. Joseph, St. Stephens. Then uh, why should we support when you have problem? You have not admitted a single Dalit into your school for centuries and centuries. You have educated, already those who educated were educated in Sanskrit. So they have shifted from Sanskrit to English and they are doing this. It is between you and them. Where are we? So they said, uh, no, 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 you have come to accuse us. No, I said, no. If you were to give us English education from tribal areas to villages to small towns, not a single person would have put hand on your children. We would have given that guarantee. But you have educated the upper, upper caste, not as why for money. We didn't have money. We are learning our things in regional. Abhi abhi bhi bol rahe na. So, you can learn English in government schools, Hindi, Telugu, Sanskrit. So, therefore, I gave a very mad slogan. Brahman Bache, Sanskrit, Baujan Bache, English. So, that is your mother tongue, yaar. That is your earliest tongue, yaar. That is your national tongue, yaar. And this is now our national tongue. English is our Indian national tongue because it has come to India in 1817 and it was introduced by a Brahmin and a Protestant Christian called William Gary. Both of them together in 1817. If the language for 100 years, then it is national. How many years have you been national? What is the definition? To take the definition lesson, should I go to MNC Universe again? Where do I go? So the question is, if caste, caste came in the way of government schools versus private schools, why did Nehru allow private schools in English and government schools in regional languages? What was the standard? And why is now present government which is more nationalist is allowing private schools in English and government schools in regional language? My simple answer is, let us be more nationalist. Don't give a single job who studies abroad in, from this country. You give jobs only to Hindi wala, Kutelgu wala, Kutamil wala, Kumalayana wala. In Delhi maybe they do. Nationalism is the best way to do it, but it is not the best way to do it. So then, why English for that? Why are you importing economists from there? Why are you importing? Do you mean to say we are incapable of handling our economy? When we could domesticate a buffalo which the world could not domesticate, we can domesticate every industry. I will give you one example. One day, he was my great friend, Arunar Gosa. <laughs> he used to call me on TV every major time. So one day, Parliament Committee decided that reservation should be extended to private sector. So he had a TV debate. So I was in Chennai. He sent his teams, because they are big teams, he was in, in Times Now at that time. So his uh, teams came after me, phone call. They arranged for me a special thing in a five star hotel there where I went for a meeting. Then he started saying, Professor Kanchai Rai, this night it must be settled now. It must be decided now. You have already destroyed higher education. Now you want to destroy industries. 
Now, why you want to destroy industries? Are you a nationalist or are you anti-nationalist? Tell me. This now, all viewers are looking at us. The whole country is looking at us. Then uh, five minutes. It, it has to be decided now. <laughs> so I patiently hurry. And now it has to be really decided now. I said, all these industries are headed by your caste people now. And our industries are nowhere when compared to China. Tell me, your grandfather or grand-grandfather or great-grandfather ever till the land? Killing the land is a merit. Production, food. You, are, you have eaten food and gone to the studio. I am going to eat in five-star hotel just now after finishing. But that labor source is my grandfather, but not your grandfather. It has to be settled now. <laughs> now the whole country should watch. Make them watch what I am saying. I said, your merit, meritlessness of the Brahmanism has destroyed the merit of this country. If we come into industries, if we come into higher education and industries, I'll tell you, within 25 years we can support China. Yes. And I'm guaranteeing you, we will not allow an inch of land to Chinese. But not with yoga. <laughs> <laughs> because if, we go, if I go and see yoga on Himalayas, the Chinese fellow, and also not with vegetarianism. If I go and sit in yoga and eat vegetarian, the Chinese fellows will eat all kinds of things including shades, come with karate. <laughs> then I will not allow an inch of land to Pakistan. Because it is my grandparents and SCST, OBC, children's grandparents who built this land, not your grandparents. Admission is category, I am telling you, team. The same difference intellectual should have been all over the world. But today, the villagers who are coming with a little bit of English into the colleges, take out the Dalit literature, take out the Sudra literature, take out the writing, the original writing of Mahatma Pule. Did anybody write a book? In the entire existing history of India ever since Rukweda Ru, that there is a system called slavery in India. It was Mahatma Bhule who wrote the book called Slavery. Any woman wrote a book? Till Savitri Bai came and wrote her first poems. Even Brahmin women written evidences are not there for me. So, the killers and pot makers and shoemakers and fishing communities, barbers, is there a great doctor than a barber in the world? American Medical Association keeps every time doc, the head of the association a barber. And air cutting is called on the shops you see, air surgery. Now here, barbers are untouchables. But barbers were the first surgeons in this country. So, when caste becomes international, the laws that come from that country will influence this country and we will... See, I am not worried about reservation. It will not be there forever. And I went on record and I am telling in this college, you can quote me anytime, give English education to Dalit Adivasi, killing us children for 25 years on equal basis with equal school facility and with equal thing, just remove reservation. And we guaranteed 
in no institution of a culture youth can exist or be developed. That talent of engaging with nature, production, is always produces knowledge. Knowledge production is not from book to book. When I said all this Delhi, my friend intellectuals are producing books. What books? They said Anchayalaya writes without footnotes. His book should, should be banned. That's what Delhi University Reservation was. No references. No footnotes. Therefore it, his book should not be taught. Even my own Marxist friend said that where is footnote? Savannah studies of footnote of text. And the only essay in the ninth volume of that book is Consciousness and History written by me without footnote. Then I said, I asked these people who wanted to ban my books without footnote, was there a footnote to Gandhi's Hindu Swarat? Was there a footnote to Kautilya Sardeshastra? Was there a footnote whom you respected so, even the Jain you respected, was there a footnote to Plato's Republic? Aristotle politics, did they write with footnotes? Then I said, footnote writing is nothing but reading 10 books of Europeans and writing 11 book out of those 10 books, which is nothing but litigation research. <laughs> Original knowledge should be brought from the people's life. How do they kill? How do they engage with each other? What are the marriage systems? What are the progressive systems? How do they produce? What is the relationship between seed and soil? How the farmers? Therefore, if St. Second College tomorrow produces students of research scholars, don't do research from book to book. Go to the people. Study the people's life. People's life is not recorded only in this country in the world. And every village is a source of history, museum, science, technology, engineering and everything. But you are not recorded. Imagine there was a Tank builder in Arappa city 3000 years before Jesus Christ, Christian era. And there are tanks in the village Islam. We have a goddess called Katta Maisama on the tank bed. I said, all these goddesses, Katta Maisama, have really built tanks. It is a woman's knowledge. Goddess Pochama is a medicinal curer. You have to study. So let us be nationalists. If we challenge, don't read any Western book from now onwards. Let us write our books and read our books. Let us see what we produce. Why should we do that? But they also quote only them. So therefore, we ask when it goes to beyond borders. And cast, again as cast, universal laws come the universal knowledge of changing will expand and we will be ashamed to not to abolish our own thing. So, I am glad these young students, these bright students, you know, brightness does not just mean speaking what I call Christian school English. No, there is no not very good uh, Ambani school English. Still, Christian school English is the best. That's what they also believe. But the point is, how you go and catch the root of the civilization, where which is located in the production, with the cattle, with animals, animal equality, human equality, technology equality, and human mental equality, ultimately, Marriage without caste will produce hybrid brain that can produce better scientists. 
So lastly, in Corona time, I wrote my autobiography called I'm a Shepherd Boy to an Intellectual. In that, there is a chapter, please read it, My Experiments with Untruth. Now there I examined Gandhi, examined Radha Krishna, and examined Nehru. But there also I referred to one quote from the world famous economist from this country called Amartya Sen. Amartya Sen in his autobiography, there was a little autobiography earlier, now he has written a bigger one. He said, my father is a great Sanskrit and mathematics scholar. My Grandfather is a very great Sanskrit scholar. Now this sentence actually destroys the confidence of other castes who were not allowed to read Sanskrit. Do you know that? The impact of that. Mind great. Everything is great Sanskrit scholar. Where is Sanskrit? Is Sanskrit there in killing? Is Sanskrit there in your own mother's kitchen? Is Sanskrit there? So he wrote that. Then what should I write? I simply wrote, if Amartya says father was a great Sanskrit scholar, my father was a great, great shepherd. <laughs> and what he taught me? If his father and grandfather taught him mathematics and Sanskrit, from there he entered into English and then from he there he entered into, went into England and from there he settled down in America. I always lived here. This is the greatest thing that I am doing. And the other thing I said is my father taught me at the age of eight how to midwife the delivery of a sheep. How to midwife. While delivering sheep suffers a lot. They, they use fingers to widen the path of the delivery and easily remove the baby sheep. And my father taught me how to survive, keep the world survive by making me a midwife at the age of eight and that your father can never do. The pride of production, the pride of agrarian civilization, the pride of we have killed agricultural philosophy. China has agrarian philosophy. There are a huge number of agricultural philosophies. It's called agriculturism, and we have no agriculturism. Because Sutras were never respected. So we should restore that and hope colleges like these, particularly Christian colleges, must send the students at least for three months into villages to stay there, live there, eat with them, and interact with them, learn their science and technological and human values, and then produce dissertations for their master course. Thank you.